Chapter 17. Jim, I said, are those the Yules sitting down yonder? Hush, said Jim. Mr. Heck Tate's testifying. Mr. Tate had dressed for the occasion. He wore an ordinary business suit, which made him look somehow like every other man. Gone were his high boots, lumber jacket, and bullet-studded belt. From that moment, he ceased to terrify me. He was sitting forward in the witness chair, his hands clasped between his knees, listening attentively to the circuit solicitor. The solicitor of Mr. Gilmer was not well known to us. He was from Abbotsville. We saw him only when court convened, and that rarely for court was of no special interest to Jim and me. A balding, smooth-faced man, he could have been anywhere between 40 and 60. Although his back was to us, we knew he had a slight cast in one of his eyes, which he used to his advantage. He seemed to be looking at a person when he was actually doing nothing of the kind. Thus, he was hell on juries and witnesses. The jury, thinking themselves under close scrutiny, paid attention. So did the witness, thinking likewise. In your own words, Mr. Tate, Mr. Gilmer was saying. Well, said Mr. Tate, touching his glasses and speaking to his knees. I was called. Could you say it to the jury, Mr. Tate? Thank you. Who called you? Mr. Tate said, I was fetched by Bob, by Mr. Bob Ewell yonder, one night. What night, sir? Mr. Tate said, it was the night of November 21st. I was just leaving my office to go home when B, Mr. Ewell, came in. Very excited he was, and said he get out to his house quick. Some inward raped his girl. Did you go? Certainly. Got in the car and went as fast as I could. And what did you find? Found her lying on the floor in the middle of the front room. One on the right as you go in. She was pretty well beat up. But I heaved her to her feet, and she was, she washed her face in a bucket in the corner, and she was all said she was all right. I asked her who hurt her, and she said it was Tom Robinson. Judge Taylor, who had been concentrating on his fingernails, looked up as if he were expecting an objection, but Atticus was quiet. Asked her if he beat her like that. She said, yes, he had. Asked her if he took advantage of her, and she said, yes, he did. So I went down to Robinson's house and brought him back. She identified him as the one, so I took him in. That's all there was to it. Thank you, said Mr. Gilmer. Judge Taylor said, any questions, Atticus? Yes, said my father. He was sitting behind his table. His chair was skewed to one side. His legs were crossed and one arm was resting on the back of his chair. Did you call a doctor, Sheriff? Did anybody call a doctor, asked Atticus. No, sir, said Mr. Tate. Didn't call a doctor. No, sir, repeated Mr. Tate. Why not? There was an edge to Atticus's voice. When I tell you why I didn't, it wasn't necessary, Mr. Finch. She was mighty banged up. Something show happened. It was obvious. But you didn't call a doctor? While you were there, did anyone send for one? Fetch for one? Carry her to one? No, sir. Judge Taylor broke in. He's answered the question three times, Atticus. He didn't call a doctor. Atticus said, I just wanted to make sure, Judge, and the judge smiled. Jim's hand, which was resting on the balcony rail, tightened around it. He drew in his breast suddenly, glancing below. I saw no corresponding reaction and wondered if Jim was trying to be dramatic. Dill was watching peacefully, and so was Reverend Sykes beside him. What is it, I whispered, and got a terse, shh. Sheriff, Atticus was saying, you say she was mighty banged up. In what way? Well, just describe her injuries, heck. Well, she was beaten around the head. There was already bruises coming on her arms, and it happened about 30 minutes before. How do you know? Mr. Tate grinned. Sorry, that was what they said. Anyway, she was pretty bruised up when I got there, and she had a black eye coming. Which eye? Mr. Tate blinked and ran his hands through his hair. Let's see, he said softly. Then he looked at Atticus as if he considered the question childish. Can't you remember? Atticus asked. Mr. Tate pointed to an invisible person five inches from him and said, her left. Wait a minute, Sheriff, said Atticus. Was it her left facing you or her left looking the same way you were? Mr. Tate said, oh yes, that would make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now, she was bunged up on the side of her face. Mr. Tate blinked again, as if something had suddenly been made plain to him. Then he turned his head and looked around at Tom Robinson. As if by instinct, Tom Robinson raised his head. Something had been made plain to Atticus also, and it brought him to his feet. Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was a right eye, I said. No, Atticus walked to the court reporter's desk and bent down to the furiously scribing hand. It stopped, flipped back the shorthand pad, and the court reporter said, Mr. Finch, I remember now she was banged up on that side of the face. Atticus looked up at Mr. Tate. Which side again, heck? The right side, Mr. Finch, but she had more bruises 
You want to hear about him? Atticus seemed to be bordering on another question, but he thought of better and of it and said, Yes, what were her other injuries? As Mr. Tate answered, Atticus turned and looked at Tom Robinson, as if to say this was something they hadn't bargained for. Her arms were bruised, and she showed me her neck. There were definite finger marks on her gullet, all around her throat. At the back of the, her neck? I'd say they were all around, Mr. Finch. You would? Yes, sir. She had a small throat. Anybody could have reached around it with. Just answer the question, yes or no, please, Sheriff, said Atticus, dryly, and Mr. Tate fell silent. Atticus sat down and nodded to the circuit solicitor, who shook his head at the judge, who nodded to Mr. Tate, who rose stiffly and stepped down from the witness stand. Below us, heads turned, feet scraped the floor, babies were shifted to shoulders, and a few children scampered out of the courtroom. The Negroes behind us whispered softly amongst themselves. Dill was asking Reverend Sykes what it was all about, but Reverend Sykes said he didn't know. So far, things were utterly dull. Nobody had thundered. There was no arguments between opposing counsel. There was no drama. A grave disappointment to all present, it seemed. Atticus was proceeding amiably, as if it were he who were involved in a title dispute. With his infinite capacity for calming turbulent seas, he could make a rape case as dry as a sermon. Gone was the terror in my mind of stale whiskey and barnyard smells, of sleepy-eyed, sullen men, of husky voice calling in the night. Mr. Finch, they gone? Our nightmare had gone with daylight. Everything would come out all right. All the spectators were as relaxed as Judge Taylor, except Jim. His mouth was twisted into a purposeful half-grin, his eyes happy about, and he said something about cooperating evidence, which made me sure he was showing off. Robert E. Lee Ewell. In answer to the clerk's booming voice, a little bent man, cock of a man, rose and strutted to the stand, the back of his neck reddening at the sound of his name. When he turned around to take an oath, we saw that his face was as red as his neck. We also saw no resemblance to his namesake. A shock of wispy, new, washed hair stood up from his forehead. His nose was thin, pointed, and shiny, and he had no chin to speak of. It seemed to be part of his creepy neck. So help me God, he crowed. Every town the size of Maycomb had families like the Ewells. No economic fluctuations changed their status. People like the Ewells lived as guests in the county in prosperity, as well as the depths of depression. No truant officers could keep their numerous offspring in school. No public health officer could free them from congenital defects, various worms, and the diseases indigenous to filthy surroundings. Maycomb's Ewells lived behind the town garbage dump in what was once a Negro cabin. The cabin's plank walls were supplemented with sheets of corrugated iron, its roof shingled with tin cans, hammered flat, so only its general shape suggested its original design. Square, with four tiny rooms opening into a shotgun hall, the cabin rested uneasily upon four irregular lumps of limestone. Its windows were merely open spaces in the walls, which in the summertime were covered with greasy strips of cheesecloth to keep out the varmints that feasted on Maycomb's refuse. The varmints had a lean time of it, for the Ewells gave the dump a thorough gleaming every day, and the fruits of their industry, those that were not eaten, made the plot of ground around the cabin look like the playhouse of an insane child. What passed for a fence was bits of tree limbs, broomsticks, and tool shafts, all tipped with rusty hammer heads, snaggled tooth rake heads, shovels, axes, and grubbing hoes held with pieces of barbed wire. Enclosed by its barricade was a dirty yard containing the remains of a Model T Ford on blocks, a discarded dentist chair, an ancient ice box, plus lesser items, old shoes, worn out table radios, picture frames, and fruit jars under which scrawny orange chickens pecked hopefully. One corner of the yard, though, bewildered Maycomb. Against the fence, in a line, were six chipped enamel slop jars holding brilliant red geraniums, cared for as tenderly as if they belonged to Miss Maudie Atkinson, had Miss Maudie designed to permit a geranium on her permise. People said that they were Mayella Ewells. Nobody was quite sure how many children there were on the place. Some people said six, others said nine. There were always several dirty-faced ones at the windows when anyone passed by. Nobody had occasion to pass by except at Christmas when the churches delivered the baskets and when the mayor of Maycomb asked us to please help the garbage collector by dumping our own trees in the trash. 
Atticus took us with him last Christmas when he complied with the mayor's request. A dirt road ran from the highway past the dump down to a small Negro settlement some 500 yards beyond the Ewells. It was necessary either to back out of the highway or go the full length of the road and turn around. Most people turned around in the Negro's front yards. In the frosty December dusk, their cabins looked neat and snug with pale blue smoke rising from the chimneys and doorways, glowing amber from the fires aside. There were delicious smells about chicken, bacon frying crisp as in the twilight air. Jim and I detected squirrel cooking, but it took an old countryman like Atticus to identify possum and rabbit, aromas that vanished when we rode back past the Ewell residence. All the little men on the witness stand had that made him any better than his nearest neighbor was that if he scrubbed with lye soap and very hot water, his skin was white. Mr. Robert Ewell, asked Mr. Gilmer. That's my name, Captain, said the witness. Mr. Gilmer's back stiffened a little, and I felt sorry for him. Perhaps I better explain something now. I've heard that lawyers' children, on seeing their parents in court, in the heat of argument, get the wrong idea. They think opposing counsel to be personal enemies of their parents, that they suffer agonies, and are surprised to see them often go out arm in arm with their tormentors during the first recess. This was not true of Jim and me. We acquired no traumas from watching our father win or lose. I'm sorry that I can't provide this drama in this respect. If I did, it would not be true. We could tell, however, when debate became more acrimonious than professional, but this was from watching lawyers with uh, other than our father. I never heard Atticus raise his voice in all my life, except to a deaf witness. Mr. Gilmer was doing his job, as Atticus was doing his. Besides, Mr. Ewell was Mr. Gilmer's witness, and he had no business being rude to him of all people. Are you the father of Mayelle Ewell, was the next question. Well, if I ain't, I can't do nothing about it now. Her mama's dead, was the answer. Judge Taylor stirred. He turned slowly in a swivel chair and looked benignly at the witness. Are you the father of Mayella Ewell? He asked in a way that made the laughter below us stop suddenly. Yes, sir, Mr. Ewell said meekly. Judge Taylor went on in tones of goodwill. This is the first time you've ever been in court? I don't recall ever seeing you here. At the witness's affirmative nod, he continued. Well, let's get something straight. There will be no more audibly obscene speculations on any subject from anybody in this courtroom as long as I'm sitting here. Do you understand? Mr. Ewell nodded, but I don't think he did. Judge Taylor sighed and said, all right, Mr. Gilmer. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ewell, would you tell us in your own words what happened on the evening of November 21st, please? Jim grinned and pushed his hair back. Just in your own words was Mr. Gilmer's trademark. We often wondered who else's words Mr. Gilmer was afraid his witness might employ. Well, the night of November 21, I was coming in from the woods with a load of kindling, and just as I got to the fence, I heard Mayella screaming like a stuck hog inside the house. Here, Judge Taylor glanced sharply at the witness and must have decided his speculations devoid of evil intent, for he had subsided sleepily. What time was it, Mr. Ewell? Just before sundown. Well, I was saying, Mayella was screaming, fit to beat Jesus. Another glance from the bench silenced Mr. Ewell. Yes, she was screaming, said Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Ewell looked confusedly at the judge. Well, Mayella was raising this holy racket, so I dropped my load and run as fast as I could. But I run to the fence. But when I got the distangled, I run up to the window and seen Mr. Ewell's face grew scarlet. He stood up and pointed his finger at Tom Robinson. I seen that black inward yonder rutting on my Mayella. So serene was Judge Taylor's court that he had few occasions to use his gavel, but he hammered fully five minutes. Atticus was on his feet at the bench, saying something to him. Mr. Hecate, uh, as first officer of the county, stood in the middle aisle, quelling the packed room, courtroom. Behind us, there was an angry, muffled groan from the colored people. Reverend Sykes leaned across Dill and me, pulling at Jim's elbow. Mr. Jim, he said, you better take Miss Jean Louise home. Mr. Jim, you hear me? Jim turned his head. Scout, go home. Dill, you and Scout will go home. Gotta make me first, I said, remembering Atticus's blessed dictum. Jim scowled furiously at me, then said to Reverend Sykes, I think it's okay, Reverend. She doesn't understand it. I was mortally offended. I most certainly do. I can understand anything you can. Ah, hush. She doesn't understand it, Reverend. She ain't nine yet. Reverend Sykes's black eyes were anxious. Mr. Finch know you all are here? 
that ain't fit for Miss Jean Louise or you boys either. Jim shook his head. He can't see us this far away. It's all right, Reverend. I knew Jim would win because I knew nothing could make him leave now. Dill and I were safe for a while. Atticus could see us from where he was if he looked. As Judge Taylor banged his gavel, Mr. Ewell was sitting smugly in the witness chair, surveying his handiwork. With one phrase, he had turned happy picnickers into a sulky, tense, murmuring crowd, being slowly hypnotized by gavel taps lessening in intensity until only sound in the courtroom was a dim pink, pink, pink. The judge might have been raping the bench with a pencil. Wrapping the bench with a pencil. In possession of his court once more, Judge Taylor leaned back in his chair. He looked suddenly wary. His age was showing, and I thought about what Atticus had said. He and Mrs. Taylor didn't kiss much. He must have been nearly 70. There has been a request, Judge Taylor said, that this court room be cleared of spectators, or at least of women and children, a request that will be denied for the time being. People generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for and they have the right to subject their children to it. But I can assure you of one thing, you will receive what you see and hear in silence, or you will leave this courtroom, but you won't leave it until the whole boiling of you come before me on contempt charges. Mr. Ewell, you will keep your testimony within the confines of Christian English usage, is that, if that is possible. Proceed, Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Ewell reminded me of a deaf mute. I was sure he had never heard the words Judge Taylor directed at him. His mouth struggled silently with them, but their, important, their import registered on his face. Smugness faded it from it, replaced by a dogged earnestness, earnestness that fooled the Judge Taylor not at all. As long as Mr. Yule was on the stand, the judge kept his eyes on him, as if daring him to make a false move. Mr. Gilmer and Atticus exchanged glances. Atticus was sitting down again. His fist rested on his cheek and we could not see his face. Mr. Gilmer looked rather desperate. A question from Judge Taylor made him relax. Mr. Ewell, did you see the defendant having sexual intercourse with your daughter? Yes, I did. The spectators were quiet, but the defendant said something Atticus whispered to him. And Tom Robinson was silent. You say you were at the window, asked Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. How far is it from the ground? About three foot. Did you have a clear view of the room? Yes, sir. How did the room look? Well, it was all slung about, like there was a fight. What did you do when you saw the defendant? Well, I run around the house to get in, but he run out the front door just ahead of me. I saw who he was, all right. I was too distracted about Mayella to run after him. I run in the house, and she was lying on the floor squalling. Then what did you do? Why, I run for Tate as quick as I could. I knowed who it was all night. Live down yonder from that inward nest. Pass the house every day. Judge, I've asked this county for 15 years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around. Sides devaluing my property. Thank you, Mr. Ewell, said Mr. Gilmer hurriedly. The witness made a hasty descent from the stand and ran smack into Atticus, who had risen to question him. Judge Taylor permitted the court to laugh. Just a minute, sir, said Atticus genuinely. Can I ask you a question or two? Mr. Ewell backed up into the witness chair, settled himself, and regarded Atticus with haughty suspicion, an expression common to make home county witnesses when confronted by opposing counsel. Mr. Ewell, Atticus began, folks were doing a lot of running that night. Let's see, you say you ran into the house, you ran to the window, you ran inside, you ran to Mayella, you ran for Mr. Tate. Did you, during all this running, run for a doctor? What a no need to, I seen what happened. But there's one thing I don't understand, said Atticus. Weren't you concerned with Mayella's condition? I most positively was, said Mr. Ewell. I seen who done it. No, I mean her physical condition. Did you not think the nature of her injuries warranted immediate medical attention? What? Didn't you think she should have had a doctor immediately? The witnesses said he never thought of it, had never called a doctor in any of his life, and if he had, it would have cost him five dollars. That's all, he asked. Not quite, said Atticus casually. Mr. Ewell, you heard the sheriff's testimony, didn't you? How's that? You were in the courtroom when Mr. Heck Tate was on the stand, weren't you? You heard everything he said, didn't you? Mr. Ewell considered the matter carefully and seemed to decide that the question was safe. Yes, he said. Do you agree with his description of Mayla Ewell's injuries? How's that? Atticus looked around at Mr. Gilmer and smiled. 
Mr. Ewell seemed determined not to give the defense the time of day. Mr. Tate testified that her right eye was blackened, that she was beaten around the, oh yeah, said the witness. I hold with everything Tate said. You do? Asked Atticus mildly. I just want to make sure. He went to the court reporter, said something, and the reporter entertained us for some minutes by reading Mr. Tate's testimony, as if it were stock market quotations. Which I, her left, oh yes, that would be make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now. She was bunged. He flipped the page. Upon that side of the face, Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was her right eye, I said. Thank you, Bert, said Atticus. You heard it again, Mr. Ewell. Do you have anything to add to it? Do you agree with the sheriff? I holds with tape. Her eye was blackened and she was mighty beat up. The little man seemed to have forgotten his previous humiliation from the bench. It was becoming evident that he thought Atticus was, and once more, he was a red little rooster. I thought he'd burst his shirt at Atticus's next question. Mr. Ewell, can you read and write? Mr. Gilmer interrupted. Objection, he said. Can't see what witnesses' literacy has to do with the case. Irrelevant and immaterial. Judge Taylor was about to speak, but Atticus said, Judge, if you'll allow the question plus another one, you'll see soon. All right, let's see, said Judge Taylor, but make sure we see Atticus overruled. Mr. Gilmer seemed as curious as the rest of us as to what bearing the state of Mr. Ewell's education, education had on the case. I'll repeat the question, said Atticus. Can you read and write? I most positively can. Will you write your name and show us? I most positively will. How do you think I sign my relief checks? Mr. Ewell was endearing himself to his fellow citizens. The whispers and chuckles below us probably had to do with what a card he was. I was becoming nervous. Atticus seemed to know what he was doing, but it seemed to me that he'd gone frog sticking without a light. Never, never, never on cross-examination ask a witness a question you don't already know the answer to was a tenant I absorbed with my baby food. Do it and you'll often get an answer you don't want, an answer that might wreck your case. Atticus was reaching into the inside pocket of his coat. He drew out an envelope, then reached into his vest pocket and unclipped his fountain pen. He moved leisurely and had turned so that he was in full view of the jury. He unscrewed the fountain pen cap and placed it gently on the table. He shook the pen a little, then handed it with the envelope to the witness. Would you write your name for us? He asked. Clearly now, so the jury can see you do it. Mr. Ewell wrote on the back of the envelope and looked up complacently to see Judge Taylor staring at him as if he were some fragment gardenia in full bloom on the witness stand. To see Mr. Gilmer half sitting, half standing at his table, the jury was watching him. One man was leaning forward with his hands over the railing. What's so interesting? He asked. You're left-handed, Mr. Ewell, said the Judge Taylor. Mr. Ewell turned angrily to the judge and said he didn't see what being left-handed had to do with it. That he was a Christ-fearing man, Atticus Finch was taking advantage of him. Tricking lawyers like Atticus Finch took advantage of him all the time with their tricking ways. He had told them what happened. He'd say it again and again, which he did. Nothing Atticus asked him after that shook his story. That he looked through the window, then ran the inward off, and then ran for the sheriff. Atticus finally dismissed him. Mr. Gilmer asked him one more question. About your writing with your left hand, are you ambidextrous, Mr. Ewell? I most positively am not. I can use one hand as good as the other. One hand good as the other, he added, glaring at the defense table. Jim seemed to be having quite a fit. He was pounding the balcony rail softly, and once he whispered, we've got it. I didn't think so. Atticus was trying to show, it seemed to me, that Mr. Ewell could have beaten up Mayella, that much I could follow. If her right eye was blackened and she was beaten mostly on the right side of her face, it would tend to show that a left-handed person did it. Sherlock Holmes and Jim Finch would agree, but Tom Robinson could easily be left-handed too, like Mr. Heck Tate. I imagined a person facing me went through a swift mental pantomime and concluded that he might have held her with his right hand and pounded her with his left. I looked down at him. His back was to us, but I could see his broad shoulders and bull thick neck. He could easily have done it. I thought Jim was counting his chickens.